Hello. Welcome to my woodworking shop. My name is Kenneth Paul. It's a genuine pleasure to have you here. Each week I try to produce a video showcasing either a project or a technique from here in my woodworking shop. This week's project is a strip-built wooden sea kayak. This is an older project, so the first 60 seconds of the video you're about to see has some lines going through it. But just sit through that first minute and the rest of it's fine. If you like the content that I'm producing here, do me a favor, hit subscribe and hit the notification bell. Thank you very much. Now let's get on with the building of the sea kayak from start to finish. All right, have a good day. Okay, what we have here are the plans for the Guillemot kayak, 17 foot, designed by Nick Shada. And what we have here are the cedar strips being milled to thickness, full length, 18 and 19 foot long on the red cedar, 15 and 10 foot long on the Alaskan white cedar. All right, the next step will be to rip the cedar into the quarter inch strips necessary to make the bead strips. All right, let's proceed. Okay, and over here we see all those boards that were playing for thickness. Well, they're all being ripped into strips now. There's set up. Goes all the way back. And a couple of boards have already been neatly stacked into strips. Okay. Well, I'm going to continue ripping these into quarter inch strips. A few more to go. Okay. Okay. Well, I've milled all the strips to the right thickness. I made an overhead rack for them to make them convenient to get to while I'm working on them. And now I'm in the process of running the Coven bead strips on them. Outside, I've got my router table set up, which I made with dual port dust collection. And you can see I've got the little crank hooked up so I can raise and lower the router without having to get inside the cabinet any. And right now I'm running the Cove. Actually, I'm running the feet, I'm sorry. <laughs> you see how the stock is square. And on the completed ones, I get one square edge and one rounded cove bead, uh, bead edge. After I run all of the stock with the bead, I'll start over again with the setup and make the cove. All right, that's it for now. All right, now we're running the cove on the strips. All the strips up above have had the bead cut onto them. Now the router table is set up. You can't see any difference, but it has the uh, cove cutter instead of the bead cutter on it now. Yeah, those CMT bits are great. All right. Now, as you can see, I'm now cutting the cove. The bead has been cut, the rounded part. Now I'm cutting the cove so they'll fit together. And every one of these strips needs that done. <laughs> oh, well, back to cutting beads. Ah, uh, coves. Well, all the strips are milled. They all have the cove and bead on them. All the western red cedar, the Alaskan white cedar, and the cherry I'm using for the combing and cockpit. All milled. Now, I've attached the patterns for the bulkheads that go on the strong back for the forms. Let's see. I've attached them to some half inch plywood. 
I rough cut them out with a jigsaw. Now I just have to cut them out on the bandsaw. Crash. Okay, I built the strong back that the forms go on and the support horses for it for workstation. I made the strong back out of plywood. Let's see what I have here. And then I filled the plywood up with structural foam to make it a little bit more solid. And I also prepared the bow and the stern forms with a separate piece of cedar that I'll be leaving in place as an internal uh, stem piece. You can see that's been brought to a knife edge. Okay. Well, I'm ready to start cutting those forms out on the bandsaw, so might as well get to it. All right, I've finished cutting out all the forms and I've installed them on the strong back. I say rather than cutting out for the for the uh, strong back on the bow and stern pieces, what I did was I cut slots into the strong back and then slid the stern and bow pieces into place. Just made it easier for me, I think. Okay. Now, I think we're ready to actually start stripping this thing. Okay, well, I've laid out the first uh, shear strip. That defines where the top and bottom of the kayak will come together later. And as you can see, it takes a lot of spring clamps. But that's the first strip. I coated the edges of all the forms with shellac because rather than using staples, which any sane person would use to put the strips on, I'm going to try to hot glue gun them on. That way no staple holes will show. Well, we'll see later if that's a good idea or not. All right, back to work. All right, I've got the first few strips started on. Okay, now I think I the same amount on each side. All right, well, time to put some more strips on. Okay, well, I've added some more strips. Let's see what we've got here. Starting to take shape, slow but sure. And over here, just a close up of the type of joint I'm using. You can see that as I bring the two strips in, I cut a matching bevel on them, just like you were matching moldings on uh, furniture, which is pretty much how I'm trying to build this. Okay, well, time to put some more strips on, I guess. 
All right, I've got the center strips run. Now it's just a matter of filling in those little football shapes. And you're getting there. Slow but short. Okay, time to add some more strips. Okay, I finished stripping the hull. I've done some rough planing on it. Gonna do a little more work with the block plane and spoke shave, then I can sand it fair. But first, I think it's time to flip it over and start the deck. Okay. Okay. I installed some webbing in my stands. To hold the boat now that it's flipped over. I had to add a step compared to normal construction because I used hot glue gun glue. I had to pull the forms off the hull while the strips aren't on the top, because if I had tried to strip the deck, I never would have gotten the hull out. As it is, I'd use little hardwood wedges to pop the uh, forms out of the hull. Now that that's done, I cleaned all the hot glue out by scraping it. I got the form back in. Now I can start with the sheer strips on the hull, on the deck. All right, back to it. All right, I've started to add my design strip. That's the first section of my design. And I have something else in mind for right there, if it works out. <laughs> All right, I think it's time to start filling in the sections I have missing. That's it for now. Okay, I finished filling in both sides. Currently filling in the very back. A little more to go there. And then I'll start filling in around the cockpit area. Yep. Back to it. Okay, well I've finished stripping everything. I just have to do the cockpit recess now. Okay. I have one more design to do on the deck. As I said earlier, I had something in mind for right here. And what I did was I built a duplicate of the tops of forms number six and seven. And then I stripped those forms. And then I took a picture from a magazine that I liked. I had it blown up. Then I glued it on to a piece of that duplicate hull section that I had made. 
and you can see I've already started filling in the white sections here, 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 and here. I put in pieces of dark wood. You can see it better from the back. So now all I've got to do is take a coping saw, cut out the design, then cut a matching hole in the deck and put it in. And I'll have a strip through design a lot easier than if I had tried to strip the design as I stripped the deck. Should work out. <laughs> we will see. All right. Well, I still got some more bearing sanding to do, a little bit of planing, and but it's starting to come together. All right, that's it for now. Okay, I've started stripping out the cockpit area. As you can see, I'm stripping across it with cherry. And what that does is it gives me a flatter area to put my combing in, so I only have to deal with the curve lengthways instead of side to side. And you can see I've cut in the hole for my design. And here's the design that goes in that hole. Let me see if I can just drop it in there. And once I epoxy that in place and sand the paper off, that'll be one inlaid design done. Okay. Well, I suppose I should get to it then. Catch ya. Okay. Well, I finished putting the design into the hull. I'm pleased with the way it turned out. Let's see what we have here. And I say, rather than having an inlay, what you end up with is a design that's actually stripped right into the hull. And to me, a lot easier making a separate hull and cutting it out and putting it in than if you'd have tried to strip that design in to begin with. And you can see over here, let me get this weight off of here. And this last little clip. Hmm. Yeah, man. There it goes. There. You can see I finished filling in the first layer around the cockpit area. Now, after I put the layer of fiberglass on the outside of the hull, I'll cut out the final cockpit shape into that recessed area that I've created. But first, I have some sanding to do. And I still have to fare out and sand along the shear line and the entire hull. The deck's pretty much done. All right, well, I suppose I should get to it then. Okay, I put fiberglass on the deck last night. Okay, we're getting there. Well, back to work on the other stuff. Okay, well, I haven't done anything new to the deck, but I did put the hull up on hangers up on top to free my bench. So, so now it's up out of the way. Okay. All right. Well, the next thing to do is to fiberglass the outside of that hull. But first, I got to wet sand this when it dries. 
so I can put another coat epoxy on it. Okay, back to work. All right, here's the hole with the fiberglass laid out on it. And in a few moments, I'll be applying the epoxy. Okay. Like I say, the cloth becomes virtually transparent after the epoxy goes on. And as you can see from the completed hull, or completed deck above, although that probably still needs one more coat of epoxy later, I'll see after I'm finished sanding it. All right, time to get on with the epoxying then. Okay. Well, I've fiberglassed out the hull. I put two layers on the bottom and two layers of the bow and stern on the edges. I say I'll have to sand it down one more time to bear it out and probably put one more coat epoxy after it's put together. I just put the hull down on top of the deck just to give an idea of what it'll look like. All right. Well, time to start standing the inside of the hull on the deck. Back to it. Okay. Well, I put the combing up. I've got the outside of the combing fiberglass. You can see I finished cutting out the cockpit. I left part of the recess area of the cockpit hanging into the uh, center so that I can use it for thigh braces. Now the next thing I need to do is to fiberglass the inside of the combing. And then I can put on the combing lip, then I can cut out the hatch cover, then I can put in the cheek plate, <laughs> and etc. All right, well, I cut the hole out for the rear hatch. Broke my heart to cut a hole in my hull, but there's the cover that'll go back on. And over here you can see I've started gluing on the combing lip. And like they say, you can never have enough clamps. There's the joint I'm using in front. No problem with using a joint like that. I can only put on one strip at a time for the combing lip. All right. Well, a lot of stuff to do, so get to it. Okay. Well, I finished laminating up the lip for the combing. Let's take a peek here. And you can see the joint I used here. I guess to overlap each one as I went. And over here, we've got the recessed bungee cord holders or deck line holders. I've got these mounted in already. I made them out of walnut, which is dark wood, which will match the dark stripes, and I made them the same width as the stripes, kind of make them blend into the deck. This is what they look like rough. Basically, it's a half moon shape inside. I just cut it with a Forstner bit, and then glued a piece of wood over the hole I made with the Forstner bit, and then inserted a dowel. Here's one that's already fit out. It's already cut so that it goes inside this hole. And once that's epoxied in there, uh, I'll be able to epoxy the outside. I'll sand it flush with the surface, epoxy the outside, and these will be done. 
these have been these are already epoxied in. I've just got to sand them flush and then epoxy them to the surface. All right, get on with it. Okay, uh, I finished joining the two halves together. As you can see, I haven't removed the tape from it. Basically, what you do is you tape the two halves together, and then you join them together from the inside by putting two layers of fiberglass and epoxy over the seam. And that would be right here. One layer of two inch and a layer of one inch over the seam. And you gotta roll that down inside, which is a real pain. But that's done. Okay, uh, finished the combing off. That came out okay. I'm happy with it. Uh, I've got the little I made a little cherry block to hook the back of the seat up to. All right. And we're getting there. Starting to actually look like a kayak now. All right. Well, time to take the tape off, and now I have to put a matching fiberglass and epoxy seam tape on the outside seam. All right. Back to it. Okay, I started my end pours. I did the end pour on the stern section. Now I'm doing the end pour on the bow section. Basically what you do is you climb up the step ladder, <laughs> and from the cockpit area, you lower a cup full of uh, resin mixed with uh, phenolic balloons, and dump about four and a half ounces or so into the end. It gives the end a little bit of more strength. You know, you couldn't run the tape all the way from the inside. And it also gives you a place to drill for your uh, grab loops on the end. I have the uh, end of the kayak sitting in a bucket of water because when you have that much epoxy mixed up in a bunch and left sat there, it gets real hot. That's to keep it cool. Hang on, I'll give you a shot of what the inside looks like. All right, and that's the inside of the kayak. And that's the end pour. You can see it bubbling up from the heat now. Okay. And I say I've already done the other end, so... That's pretty much that. Okay. Well, I've got some work to do. I've started cutting out I'm going to attach my hatch lid from underneath with bungee cords so that I won't have anything showing on top. So I've got to make four hooks for the bungee cords to attach to the lid. So I'm carving those up. I've got three more to round up and then I can glue those on. And we're getting there. I've got to make the uh, foot braces and everything yet, but we're getting there. All right, back to it. Okay. Well, I started scraping the surface smooth using a Sandvik carbide uh, scraper and I'm pretty much done scraping so now what remains for me to do is to wet sand with 240 grit and I'll be ready to varnish oh let's see what else have we done I epoxied and flushed the bungee, bungee uh, cord holders And I put the scupper hole in to be able to lift the lid. And I put in the uh, bungee cord holders under the lid. And if you look inside, you'll see the cherry holders. I got a pair on each side. And I'll stretch a bungee cord between them. And that will hook on to the hooks. So uh, what I'll do is put the bungee cords on, and whenever I want to undo the lid, I'll just have to lift it up, unhook the bungee cord, and that should be good. Like I say, it gives me a nice flush look on top with nothing running across it, and that's what I'm looking for. And let's see, end pours are done. What I'm working on now is the foot braces. I was going to buy a set of uh, metal and plastic foot braces to bolt to the side, but 
I just can't bring myself to drill any more holes in my hull. So what I've done here is, as per uh, Nick Schott's book, I've built a movable uh, bulkhead, an adjustable bulkhead that will uh, glue down to the floor of the kayak. That's the adjustable part. Bulkhead is here. Everything's made out of hard maple except the uh, plywood, which is uh, Baltic birch. And you see this slides. Yeah, let me do it this way. As you adjust the string here, let me try and get back. You see, you can just put it right from inside the cockpit. You can just reach down and adjust it. Now, so the next thing I gotta do is secure that inside. Naturally, that won't be the string I'll be using. I'll be using a piece of quarter inch rope, but I needed something to adjust it so I know where to put it. All right, well, time to get back to it. Okay, I've moved the kayak into the house so that I could put the varnish on it without having to worry about temperature changes. And luckily we happen to be doing an addition on the house right now, so it doesn't matter that the kayak's in this room. And this is what the kayak looks like with five coats of varnish on it. I use Z-Spar's flagship varnish, and I'm happy with the results. And let's step down. I still have a couple more coats of varnish to put on the hatch cover, but the rest of the kayak is covered. Let's see what it looks like from the side. Oh, nice and shiny. Now I've started working on some of the other things I need. If we look inside here, I started on the uh, seat back. I built a little form that has the same curve as the back of the cockpit. And I just stripped it with the same design that's on the back of the hull. Back of the deck, I should say. And that'll be the seat back. Once I get strapped in, the straps go through the uh, holes so I'll put inside the epoxy cutouts I made. And that'll attach to the cheek plates. I got one more coat of epoxy to put on that, then I can sand it out and start varnishing. And I installed the foot braces. I still have the string attached, but you can see what the foot braces look like in there. Okay. I guess I haven't decided what to do with the varnish now. Should I just leave it this way or should I try to rub it out to a higher gloss? Because like I say, there's still some tiny little imperfections in the varnish because this is not a dust-free environment. We'll see. I said that was an awful lot of standing to do. But that's done. Now I've got to make the seat. I'm making the seat out of three-inch mini cell foam. There's the block of foam. I'm going to make my uh, rear bulkhead and the seat out of the three-inch mini cell foam. I'll carve that up coming up soon, actually. Not too, too much left to do. Okay. Well, I think that's it for now. Time to get back to it, I guess. Okay. All right. I've started to do some of the outfitting. I've attached the bungee cord holding mechanism for the hatch cover. Let's take a peek. And that's how the hatch is being held from underneath. When you want to unhook it, you just lift it by the scupper hole, unhook the bungees, and snap it back down. All right. Now let's get to the next piece. Hang on. Okay. 
Now you can see I've also finished carving out the seat out of the Minishell foam. I'm going to secure it with two strips of Velcro to start with until I find out exactly what position I want it in and then I'll contact cement it in once I decide what the best position will be. Alright, well I've got some more fitting to do so hang on. Okay, and here's a picture of the foot brace hooked up. You can see how the line runs from the movable bulkhead and just hooks up onto the uh, adjustment spline. And it's easy to adjust from sitting inside the cockpit. You can just move that rope to any one of the adjustment slots with great ease. Okay. Okay, well I've done some more outfitting and you can see here that I've temporarily got the back put in. The seat is uh, secured with Velcro so I can move it back and forward. I may just leave it that way or if I find that I'm not going to be moving it I'll just contact cement it in place but for now it's permanent. And you can see how the uh, seat arrangement makes, how the seat arrangement works. The backrest is adjusted through the uh, webbing buckles that go through the holes in the cheek plate. And I just got a temporary string in the back here, but you can see how it's flexible side to side, up and down. It can lean because it has a bungee cord in the back there. It lets it be fully flexible. It gives you support going back, but yet it doesn't keep you from moving around with the kayak. Uh, Hang on for a minute while I move that. I want to show you the bulkhead. Okay, I've unstrapped the seat so you can see the three inch mini cell bulkhead that I put in. That's what makes the rear compartment watertight. That three inch mini cell bulkhead separates that area. And there you can see the bulkhead finished and bungeed down from the outside. The only thing left for me to do is to run some deck lines from my recessed deck line holders. And that's it. We have a complete kayak. <laughs> Aren't we amazed? And it's only taking me what? How long has this video been? About 30 minutes? Yeah, that's about how long the whole job took. No problem. <laughs> okay. I'll take one more shot of the whole thing after I get everything fitted in. But we're finally getting there. All right, that's it for now. All right, what we have over here is a body of water. And what we have over here is our completed kayak. Guess what? <laughs> okay, you can see I put in the uh, grab loops. And I added my uh, deck rigging. The seat's hooked up properly now. And you can see the front. See where you can just barely make it out where I line the uh, holes with brass, thin wall brass tubing. Okay. And you can see the cradle system I made. Let's go sit it in the water. Okay. Well, don't let the snow fool you. Actually, it's very warm and pleasant out here. Oh, I just took her out for her first spin, and she floats, which I'm very pleased with. <laughs> Actually, performance is very nice. I'm gonna have to get used to tracking. But that's more style than it is the kayak. The kayak's decent. I just got to work on my style. Tight fit in the cockpit, but cozy enough. I'd rather have it that way. All right. I wish there was someone here to uh, tape me in it, but one finished kayak.
say that's it. Okay. I thought I'd finish up this tape with some of the other uh, woodworking projects I've been up to lately. And this is one of my rocking horses that I sell under the name of the Victorian Rocking Horse Company. You can see it's a slide-mounted rocking horse. It's about 48 inches tall. And like I say, I'm six foot, about 175, 180 pounds, and I can ride it with my feet off the ground. Let's get a close-up of the face here. Okay, I use real horse here. I use real leather when I make the saddles and bridles. I make the horse itself out of uh, poplar, the stand I carve out of oak. The horse has about 25 pieces to it as a hollow body. I use real glass eyes from a taxidermist, and it's all hand carved. Okay, on to the next. All right, here's a couple more of the rocking animals I make. These are a couple of rocking dinosaurs. This one's a rocking stegosaurus. And the fellow in the back here is a rocking Tyrannosaurus rex. And these are carved out of pine with pine rockers. All right. And this is a grouping of some of the chairs I make. Let's start on the right here. This is one of my freeform chairs. As you can see, it's sculpted. Tilt it over. And how I make that, that's made from one sheet of plywood. Basically what you do is you cut the sheet of plywood into ooh, about 90 pieces. You glue it together. That's what all those lines are, are the edges of the plywood. And then you just sculpt it. Back here is one of my favorites. It's a reproduction of a 15th century Karul chair with the acanthus leaf carving. On the arm tops. And a little lion's foot details. These chairs have been made since the Egyptian times, although this one's a copy of a piece that's in a museum in New Orleans. The nice thing about these chairs, chairs are they uh, fold up. Give me a second, I'll show you. And there's a shot of the chair folded up. As you can see, they work on a knuckle joint. That's the only really difficult piece of making these is to get that knuckle joint just right because that has to be mostly done by hand okay now next chair is an arts and crafts type of chair with the exposed Morton tenon joints the curved seat kind of adds a modern touch to it same thing with the curved and slanted backrest piece, also mortise and tenoned in. In fact, all the joints on this chair are also mortise and tenoned. 
and it's open now. Everything's modest up into the arms, and those legs are modest right into the stretcher, and the seat stretchers are modest into the arm supports. Okay, next. All right, this is one of my ocean sculpture pieces. This is a Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. This one I made for my mom. I made a duplicate of these sculptures for a boat christening down in Miami. A customer that wanted one. And that's carved out of poplar with an oak and walnut base. All right. Okay, here you see a pair of my Tansu jewelry boxes. These are Japanese style chest of drawers. Now these are put together as all my jewelry boxes are with no nails, no screws, no metal or mechanical fasteners of any kind. They're just held together with mortise and tenon joints held together with wedges. As you can see, everything is just wedged together. Unlike Western construction, it's a basically a post and rail construction. The, there are no real sides. The drawers actually become the sides and back and front of the chest. This one is done in curly maple. And this one is done in cherry with walnut accents. And when you can see by looking at it, what I've done is I've grain matched. What grain matching is, is this piece and this piece were cut out of the same board and then reinstalled in the same original relationship they had in the board. A lot more work and you can't make any mistakes, but that's the kind of touch that you just don't see in uh, woodwork anymore. It used to be very common to have that done around the turn of the century. Now grain matching is becoming a thing of the past. And my drawers are all cut with half-blind dovetails. And the drawers are all lined with red velvet. Okay. That's it for those. And this is one of my more contemporary jewelry boxes. It's made out of a very highly figured western big leaf maple. What's interesting about this type of chest is that the drawers open any way. Makes for an interesting box. Again, no nails, screws, or mechanical fasteners. And with the half line dovetail, draw detail again. Okay. And here's a few little odds and ends things I make. I make little hand carved wooden watches. 
You can either hang them on the wall, lay them on your desk, or they actually stand up on their own when you thread the uh, wristband together. And that's a little Japanese, a little Chinese puzzle box. You have to slide three, four pieces out of the way before that will open. And over here we have just another one of my little jewelry boxes. Slide this out. This one has through dovetail construction, a match grain top, and again velvet lined. Okay, and this was a fun little project. This is a uh, working 127th scale model of a 12th century trebuchet, which is to say a catapult. In its time, this was the most feared artillery made by man. Now, let's see. It has several engineering features that put it ahead of its time. It had a hinged weight box, and the sling was longer than the arm. Basically, they doubled the leverage effect by putting a sling inside that trough. Yeah, let me... That goes down inside there. And when you pull that lever, up, over, and around. I got way too much free time on my hands. <laughs> okay, enough of that one.